Kelly. Welcome, everybody, to History Matters and So Does Coffee. And for the first time in a couple of weeks, I actually have coffee in my mug. Um, today, as advertised, we're going to be talking again about bad history. We had a great conversation with, as ever, amazing questions coming from you folks out there. So amazing that we didn't get to answer them all. And one of them, I'll mention, had me wake, when I woke up this morning, it was the first thing in my head. I was like lying in bed thinking about this question, which I had read last night. So these are excellent questions. But before we get to that, I turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who will explain the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody, and good morning, newbie. Newbie is on fire today. Uh, <laughs> I'm Annie Evans from New American History, and I am delighted, as always, to be with you. We already have a very robust chat going on, if you are joining us on Zoom, that is. Uh, and as we go through the program, as Joanne said, we're kind of continuing a part two. If you didn't see part one, it's okay. You can jump in and watch part one later on. They're all archived on YouTube, apparently, but also on the NCHE forward slash conversation site. And the same, so the same place you went to, if you came yes. in, not through um, Facebook, yep. you'll be in the same place. So we have all of the um, ones for 100 and how many weeks, Carolee? 174 <laughs> weeks. Yes, this will be our 174th week. You can watch all of them. Um, in about a half an hour, I will come back and we will uh, do I want to do the the questions from last week first and then add new questions or how do you want to do that, Joanne? I want to, I, I prepared um, some of the ones from last week. Okay, perfect. Um, and so I'll, I'll put new ones in today. Perfect. Yeah, um, and then, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit just to sort of catch us up. I'll men And I'll start some of those questions. If people are dying to ask questions, then we can, you and I can sort of wing it. There's, there's a couple of them that are really, you know, we should talk about. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll see you on a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, um, as Annie suggested, um, bad history uh, is the title that I guess this is bad history part two, because you can never have enough bad history, um, is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, last week, we talked about, among other things, what's going on in Florida. And there's so much more we can talk about this week about Florida, which we don't have to, but um, the idea of the last episode was partly to talk about um, what is good history, meaning um, when people scorn revisionist history, like, I hate revisionist history. All history, in a sense, is revisionist history, right? Because what are we doing as historians or as um, scholars of history? We're looking for evidence, maybe finding new evidence, maybe asking new questions of old evidence, um, analyzing. We come to analysis with our own body of skills and assumptions. Um, so history, we are in a kind of like the debate of democracy, right? We are in an ongoing discussion about history and what we think and what we find and what others think and what they find. And we argue with each other, mostly <laughs> in a civil manner. Um, but so in a sense, people who scorn revisionist history uh, in the way that they scorn it, are kind of just scorning learning. Um, and I know it would be easy to swat at me for saying that, but um, revisionist history, kind of like a lot, a lot of other forms of rhetoric floating around these days, is used to mean a lot of things and thus to mean nothing. I don't, I'm not even going to name the words. You can think of the words. Actually, I'm going to briefly touch on critical race theory. Uh, and indeed, that's one of them. And obviously woke, everything that someone on hates on one side apparently is woke. So if you use words in that manner, um, then they you use them as though they mean everything and you sort of deliberately deny, deprive them of having any meaning, then yeah, um, you can throw them all over the place, but then the actual meaning of the word goes away. And so I think revisionist history kind of falls into that category. Um, I did talk last time um, about, you know, there are some ground rules for doing good history. And I, I briefly talked about um, look, finding real, um, verifiable evidence, looking at it in um, its proper historical context, trying to figure out what it meant when it was written, trying to figure out what it tells us about then, and then thinking about what it can tell us about what came after. 
including potentially us now. But but there are rules. Uh, there are ways of doing good history. Um, and, you know, I think very often, and we're going to come back to this with one of the questions you asked last week, often when, when you're doing good history, you don't necessarily know the outcome of what you're going to find. And I, I did mention this last week that um, I tell my students to look at the evidence and see what it tells you. I tell my undergrads and grad students the same thing. Don't assume what you think you will see because you can find it. If <laughs> this makes me think of field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. If you see it, it will be there. Um, it, you need to be open minded enough when you're doing research to um, absorb and see things you don't expect to see. And those, speaking personally, are some of the most exciting things you can find. Like, oh, I never knew that before. Like, is that true? I'm going to double check it. Can it possibly be true? Oh, it's true. So anyway, we talked about all of this um, last week. We also very briefly touched on the fact that um, complaining about bad history is not to say that history can't be bad, meaning bad things happen, have happened all the time, and they're part of the story, and on a national level, they're part of who we are, and to deny that is whitewashing history. Um, and as I mentioned last week, it, it blinds you to how we got to where we are now and makes positive change, if you see positive change as more inclusive and more democratic, virtually impossible. So whitewashing history, in a sense, is a way of, of standing still. Um, and we're going to come to this in a moment, but you know, good history leads people to ask questions, not to stop asking questions. Okay, um, and I talked, uh, I'll end this summary of last week here. We talked last week about um, some of the things, things bad history can do, such as influence Supreme Court decisions uh, and thereby influence everything or um, shape legislation, confirm political ideologies, shape elections. There are all kinds of ways in which bad history is not just um, we're going to sit around and disagree about this, but when it's deployed, particularly in a political partisan manner, it can do real damage. And we talked about all of that um, somewhat last week. Okay. So, um, and, and I will say at the beginning, I'm going to launch into some of the questions that you guys had. Um, I'll see how long it's taking me um, and whether I stop early or whether we have the questions during our normal question time. I will also say, and I'll save it till the question time, that um, I mentioned on Twitter that if that we might also discuss a little episode between Kevin McCarthy and Eric Swalwell. Um, and I'll leave that to the questions if you folks want to have a brief discussion of it, given that I am members of Congress behaving badly central here, I'd be happy to do that. But I, I want to start and potentially end with bad history. You guys can help us figure that out. Okay. Um, so uh, let me look here. Uh, so so uh, Dave, Dave Airy asked last week, are things like Senate rules, once one senator can place a hold on military promotions or one senator can say they will filibuster a bill without actually getting up on the floor, are they bad history too? I would say no, but they might be bad rules. <laughs> They're not necessarily bad history. Um, they might be creating history that is bad, um, but in essence, they're, they're things that we are watching and seeing happening that, that um, may not be good. And it, indeed, we're watching some right now that are having very bad influence. So it's a good question because it, it brings us back uh, to really being specific about what we mean by bad history. Um, Dale Van Eck said that he heard on NPR last week that one can look at Supreme Court decisions as a pendulum through American history. Is that also the case with revisionist history? Um, I, I would remove the R word. Is that also the case with history? Yes. Um, you know, and I think if, if you, let's put it this way. If there are people who are explicitly want to move history in a particular direction for whatever reason, sure, that definitely changes over time. But even more broadly than that, the kinds of questions people ask, historians ask, the topics that they're interested in dramatically change over time. And, you know, it's one of the early things you're taught in grad school when you're analyzing a book. You need to know not only who the author is and what he or she studies and who they studied with, 
you know, you, you look at the acknowledgements when you're trying to figure a book out because that might give you a clue. Um, but also you need to think about when a book was written. And so there, there are clusters, you know, a big cluster of books about one topic and it comes out um, during the civil rights era. And then all of a sudden there are all these books that come out about rights. Um, so it makes perfect sense, right? That the moment you're in gives certain kinds of issues and questions a kind of urgency. Um, and so you see those questions in front of you, you ask those questions. Those are also important moments to think about why you're asking the question and how you're asking the question and to remember to see yourself as a historian in the process so that you're not just you know i'm a person in the present not thinking about being in the present look everything's about rights you you need to be self-aware but yes i think that um the study of history in that sense is is kind of reactive um in the same way that generally speaking congress has been more often than not a reactive rather than a proactive institution. I can't, it's hard to make generalizations like that these days, given the strangeness of a particular political moment. Um, but anyway, so I, I do think that the topics of study and um, the way the questions people ask change over time. It is no surprise to me and probably isn't to you that, I don't know, I would say in the last 10 years, maybe there's been a spurt of interest in violence in American history. Why would that be, right? It makes perfect sense that people are living in a moment and they think, okay, how has violence shaped American history over time? I can study that. I can see, you know, per speaking personally, my two guys over my shoulder here smacking each other around. I'm in I didn't become interested in violence because of this moment. I've been interested in violence uh, in political history for a frighteningly long amount of time, but um, I was interested in a sense, in seeing how politicians behaved in ways that seemed to me not rational. That's what guided me, actually. It wasn't the violence. It was, why do people make choices like fighting in a duel? How would, a, how would that make sense, particularly to a politician? Why would you want to do that? So I want to understand the logic behind political things that didn't make sense to me. I, I'd have to go back and look to see uh, if there's anything, if there's a, something in that moment that led me down that path. But at any rate, very long answer to a question that yes, the moment that we're in definitely shapes what we see, what we ask, what we come up with. Okay, now this is the question that when, when I woke up, um, this is what popped into my head. I, I read over these questions last night so that I could kind of think about them in advance. Um, this is the one I woke up thinking about, and I, I think I can answer it now. I mean, it has a clear answer, but I wanted to answer it in a useful way. So the question comes from um, Tom McAndrew. And, you know, these are detailed. Tom McAndrew at 10.35 a.m. last week asked this question. So, you know, these aren't just any notes. These are accurate notes. Um, Tom asked, um, can Joanne differentiate between bad history in education and indoctrination or see them as one and the same? Now that's a really good question. Um, and even uh, bad history in education, education generally and indoctrination. These are all things, and, and I will say, if you go online, if you Google education versus indoctrination, you will see a raging conversation about what that is and what it means um, with many interesting things being said. I sort of tipped a toe in it this morning to see. And I was like, okay, you know, not only is there a raging conversation, which doesn't surprise me at all, but people already in the conversation are like, okay, back to education versus indoctrination. So there's a raging debate that has not surprisingly people irritated. Um, but at any rate, we always start with definitions. So um, to define indoctrination, two definitions, two different dictionaries. One says um, indoctrination is the process of teaching a person or group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically. Okay, another definition. Indoctrination is to teach someone to fully accept the ideas, opinions, and beliefs of a particular group and to not consider other ideas, opinions, and beliefs. Okay, now, um, one way in which there's a clear difference between that and education, and many of you out there are probably already thinking it, education is about teaching people to ask questions, right? Education is about showing 
options and different ways of thinking. It's not telling you something and instructing you to not think beyond it. So that's one obvious way, right? That was when I woke up and wasn't fully awake and had not yet had my coffee. That was what I was thinking. Well, education is, in, a, in that sense, the opposite of indoctrination. Right? I want my students to find all kinds of evidence, to draw conclusions of their own, to construct arguments, to prove the conclusions that they have, and I will evaluate them that way. And I'm not going to disagree with conclusions that do not agree with my politics. I have students of all politics in my classes, and that's just fine, right? And I'm not teaching my politics in the class. I'm teaching students how to evaluate early American history and early American historical artifacts. I want them to sit and think. I want them to learn how to analyze and process and evaluate and draw their own conclusions. I may not agree with the conclusions, but if they can prove it in a, in a sound way with evidence, I will respond to that paper probably saying, you know, I might think X, but you've proven Y here. I might not even say I might think X. I think I would say you've proven this and, and your evidence is clear and whatever. Um, at any rate, education is opening the mind. And in that sense, indoctrination is kind of closing it. And often indoctrination is for a, what was the phrase here? Um, a particular group is, is <laughs> very, very, um, it's a very nice diplomatic way of putting it. Um, Oh, here, and then I looked up actually doctrine um, because uh, PragerU has been in the news. Florida has just um, accepted PragerU uh, as a vendor uh, for education. I encourage you to look them up and see what they say. I'm not going to um, attack specifically um, a company or its brand here, but I really encourage you to look and see what they're teaching uh, and, and what they want students to think and to not think, because that's very clear. But what I want to do here is quote the originator of all of this, who is a conservative um, radio host named Dennis Prager. I think I'm saying his name right. I'm actually not sure. Prager or Prager? I think Prager. Um, he says that he's often accused of indoctrinating children. So this is his quote, you indoctrinate kids, which is true. We bring doctrines to children. That's a very fair statement. That's from Dennis Prager. Then I looked up doctrine again, always start with definitions, just to see what the sort of general definition of it bouncing around out in the world is. Doctrine is a belief or set of beliefs held and taught by a church, political party, or other group. So Dennis Prager says, yes, we are indoctrinating children. Um, we're bringing doctrine to them. We're bringing our doctrine to them. That's a form of teaching. Um, I don't think I would call it useful education because I think useful education opens the mind and broadens the mind and doesn't you know, put blinders on. But at any rate, um, it's striking that James Prager says that right outright. You indoctrinate kids? Yes, I do indoctrinate kids. Um, and he actually says the goal, uh, this is actually his words, the goal is to render history and its inheritance. No, I'm going to take this back. Is this actually what he says? I'm not going to quote this because um, I might have missed a quotation mark and I do not want to offer a quote that is inaccurate. But at any rate, um, he did say that he's very excited because their mission um, of pushing ahead with their doctrine, it's very excited. Um, it's moving on potentially to other states. Um, and in this particular article I read, it ended by saying, now it's the public's turn to respond. Yes, indeed it is. Right, so that, I will come back to that to the end. I've said that many a time. At any rate, education, opening the mind versus indoctrination, blinders so that you only see one point of view, bad history. Now, bad history, sort of where we started, right, can mean many things. Um, it can mean just someone teaching it badly, right? Bad history can be 
someone who doesn't have the information or the desire to teach useful as accurate as they can make it or as grounded in historical evidence as they can make it history, you could call that bad history. Bad history in the sense that we've been discussing it here is deliberately aimed at um, warping people's thoughts very often to support a political point of view. Um, and that's something that obviously we're seeing all over the place now in a very blatant, blunt, outright way. Um, and in a way, you know, one of the things I think that defines our time politically when it comes to extremism or this kind of behavior isn't that this is new. It's that it's wide in the open, right? It's right out there and people are proud, right? Yes, we do indoctrinate children. Um, that, that we're at a different moment in what this means and how people do or don't accept it. Um, okay. And I do actually, this relates to, this was from um, a response online to some of these videos from PragerU, which gets to what I said earlier about good history and bad history, um, that bad history is aimed at making a certain point. This particular person reviewing the Prager U videos, because it's all videos of little kids sort of asking questions often of historical figures. Um, this particular reviewer said the problem with these videos is that they start out with a certain premise. For example, the Republican party can't be the party of racism and then work backwards to find evidence that can be cherry picked to support that argument. And I talked about cherry picking evidence last week too. Um, and that's not, how history works, right? You don't say, I wanna prove this and then go back to prove it. You can prove anything, you can prove anything. And I talked last week about um, someone using half of a sentence to prove something and I read the second half and it actually, from a John Adams letter to Benjamin Rush, Rush it actually meant the opposite of what the person quoted it as. So at any rate, um, that's some of the difference between um, education, indoctrination and bad history. Hopefully that's clear and if it isn't, we can, address it during the Q&A. And I see I'm starting to run out of time. Um, I have one or two more questions from last week, and then I really do want to open things up for more questions. Um, I, I put um, two questions together. Um, so Kathleen asked, um, Hillsdale teaches children to love America and reject the notion that, that racism still permeates society. Um, Sydney. Uh, that was Kathleen V. This is Sydney Stasinos, I hope. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Why can't teachers discuss critical race theory? And those are clearly related. Um, to me, to exist in modern day America and say that racism isn't in some ways ingrained into American society, that's a hard claim to make, right? just acknowledge the fact that if someone not white is arrested, they're probably gonna face, face harsher justice, that it, people who are not white are pulled over more often by the police. I mean, we could go on and on, I'm not going to, but all of those things are entrenched and we may be aware of them more often and people have um, their phones that with cameras, we may see them more often. And so we acknowledge them and resp respond to them more than we might have in the past. but. Um, to say that racism is not ingrained in American society is quite an interesting claim, and I think a hard one to defend if you're looking at almost any area <laughs> of American society, right? I, I And particularly if you see people claiming that racism never, like, like if one way is gone, we don't need to think about racism anymore, you could argue that that's racist. <laughs> Why are you denying the simple fact, as I talked about last week, ugly, bad things happened, are happening, and the only way to move towards something better and more inclusive and more democratic is to acknowledge those things. Think about them. Think about where they came from. Think about where they were and are leading. Learn from it and act based on it to move towards something better. So denying that in and of itself <laughs> is a problem. Um, that's related obviously to the idea of why can't teachers discuss critical race theory. Now, I, I don't 
usually self-promote on here. I occasionally mention my podcast, but in this case, I will self-promote. Um, a while back uh, on my podcast now and then, and it's an and with an ampersand so that you could find it if you look for it. Um, Heather and I did an episode on critical race theory, uh, and we really just wanted to explore what it was. What is critical race theory? How is it defined by the people who created it? Uh, and how is it being used now? So we we just wanted to pin it down because obviously that grew and it grew beyond the point we were even discussing it. I, I, it must be a year ago at least when we had this conversation, the, the podcast episode. Um, and since then, right, it's it's grown to critical race theory and math or critical, whatever. The fact of the matter is critical race theory is an idea which is largely law school centric uh, so it's not everywhere. And the general idea of it is that race is racism is inherent in American society. And you need to consider that particularly in laws, the rule of law, right? You need to consider the role of race in the law and society and the role of racism in the law and society. That's what it is. It's a, an idea that was invented and taught in law school um, and, and makes sense in law school, right? To evaluate the creation and um, uh, laws that are being enforced, the enforcement of laws and to see if there's a racial component to that. That's what it is. It became everything, you know, and now you actually don't hear much about it. Now it's become wokeism that has taken the place of critical race theory, which was everywhere. Um, and we could talk about that if you want to. I, I didn't have that in my list of topics here. But at any rate, we can't discuss critical race theory. Why can't teachers discuss it? Because people have come to define it. People who do not want us to talk about racism in America have come to define it as this bad, biased, left-wing thing that um, crazy people are teaching. And it's radical. And it has nowhere in education and it's everywhere. Um, you know, if the idea is if you want to discuss racism in American society in some way or the history of race in American history itself or something, to say you can't discuss critical race theory is kind of to say you can't discuss race and, and issues and problems and questions of race in American history. And that's pretty wacky. You know, think about what, what, what that eliminates. That's that's beyond blinders. I don't know what is beyond blinders. That's that's you know. I, I always say to my um, students when you're researching in a database, you have this huge database, but you you're looking through the littlest tiniest slit because you're asking very specific questions. I'm interested in honor and dueling in this huge newspaper database, right? And you're like, what does it have about honor and dueling? And you get fifty five things that are very specifically about what you asked, <laughs> you have no idea what's all around it. You don't know how these pieces of evidence appeared, for example, on the pages of a newspaper. Um, and I think, you know, the, the same is true with um, some of these questions that people ask to, to say that we're not going to talk about race or that racism is not inherent in American society. That's almost, it's beyond whitewashing. It's, you know, we can only look here and oh, we, we can't look there. Um, it's, we're in a moment where People are conflating um, acknowledging racism in American history, past and present, um, teaching the simple fact that it was there and is still there and it's part of our country and we need to understand it if we're going to deal with it versus people who claim that to teach that is to teach students to hate America. Um, and I don't think understanding your country, I've said this before, I don't think understanding your country for better and worse, for good and bad, and having a sense of its victories as well as its failures, I don't think that that's a bad thing. I don't think that's teaching people to hate their country. I love my country. I teach the history of my country. I have for decades. And I do that not only fully aware of all of the ways and, and failures and racist components in our society, I've said this before too, I'm aware of all of the ideas and opportunities that also have been opened, sometimes not necessarily in the ways that the founders, the founder blob intended, 
but you can, you can readily acknowledge there are good things to talk about in American history. But to do that without acknowledging the bad things is to basically say to students, um, you're not allowed to fully understand your country's history because it might make us uncomfortable. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to feel guilty. We don't want to acknowledge that it's there. We don't want to look at it in the present. We're just not going to teach it. That's a big problem. That the not teaching of something can be bad history. Okay. Um, I believe that those are the questions I had um, from last week. And I will stop. Wonderfully enough, it's only three minutes after. Oh, mug, mug, mug. Um, you know, 174th episode. And I still forget until I look down and see mug, mug, mug on the bottom of the screen. Um, this one is not going to surprise you at all. Although it's not, I could have used the one from last week that history should make you uncomfortable, but I'm not. I'm using this one. Yay, oh, we got that when we were at the conference. Exactly, this I got at the NCAT conference. And this, there are so many people having conniption fits over the simple fact that this exists and what should be within it. How can there be a better mug for this week? particularly given Florida. I, I cheers you. If we could do a virtual uh, clink of the mugs. <laughs> clink. There we go. <laughs> this is my one that says life, liberty, happiness, coffee that I got at Monticello when we had our meetup there with a bunch of History Matters people last summer. It's for iced coffee because it's 110 degrees. <laughs> I, I So I my air conditioner is on. I turned it off for a second because I was it gets really cold overnight. And within like five seconds, I was like, go ahead. <laughs> put on a sweater. <laughs> put it back on, put it back on. Okay. Yeah. All right. We have had some great questions. Um, uh, Dave, our good friend Dave asks, not a bad history, but more a bad behavior question. Okay. What options does Congress have or citizens to deal with a congressman such as my own, Van or Derek Van Order, who apparently drunk at the Capitol and swore at the Senate pages in the halls of Congress refusing to apologize. He then tweeted, how do you say we've never been to Wisconsin without saying we've never been to Wisconsin? Those were constituents. You must be flatlanders. So, so when members make statements, like, is there anything he's asking bad behavior wise, what options do regular citizens have? Like Congress can censure people or whatever they call it, but can can everyday citizens bring forth like? Well, so I read, um, happy birthday, Donna, I see floating up. I read, um, and now I'm not gonna be able to remember where I read it. I read somewhere in the last week, an article um, by someone affiliated with a, a member of Congress saying, it, it, it may feel useless to you to call your member of Congress or to call a member of Congress, but particularly your member of Congress and complain. But the fact of the matter is, according to this person, phone calls actually matter. And if a member of Congress has the sense that there's a wave of sentiment about something, no telling if they'll do anything, but they certainly are either going to think before doing that again, or will actually be forced to issue some kind of a statement. So I realize it feels kind of namby-pamby to be like, here's the thing you can do. You can call your member of Congress. But if you think about it, if a lot of people do that, it can have an impact regardless of what these members of Congress think. They are there because of us um, and we can take them out. And if they have a sense that they might be taken out, they're gonna respond. And if it takes calling and saying, you know, this is un unacceptable and um, you've lost, you're gonna lose my vote and everyone else's vote if you do this and enough people do that. I don't know if you remember way, way back uh, during an argument over health insurance. Uh, I don't even remember the specifics of it. What I remember is a bazillion people called their member of Congress and they backed away. And, and I, anytime that's happened, Anywhere in, in the news, I'm always like, look, you know, because in our government, public opinion matters enormously. It's one of the ways in which our democratic republic, and yes, it is a democratic republic. I don't care if you tell me it isn't, it is. Um, and one of the things that was distinctive about it is that public opinion matters enormously, meaning people in power need to know what the public is thinking because the public ultimately shape everything. 
go back to you know early American sources and they're obsessing politicians and politicos about what public opinion is. They don't know how to find it. They don't know who the public is. They don't know how to collect it. They, they think about it all the time. There's a brief section on it in my first book, um, Affairs of Honor, about this obsession with, you know, who's the public? Who's the public? What are they thinking? They can't take a poll. Um, so at any rate, public opinion matters. It matters in politics. It obviously matters in consumerism. But um, calling your member of Congress and getting a lot of other people to do that, I, I believe that matters. And as I say all the time, speak up in whatever way you can speak up. And that's one way in which you can speak up, which you might not immediately have the satisfaction of seeing the impact, but that there can be an impact. Uh, Jen Defoe, I hope I said that last name correctly. We have a lot of Jens today. All of our favorite Jens are here. Um, <laughs> it says, does bad knowledge of history lead to those bad rules? Like, you mean uh, in, in Congress? Like, like, I think that's what she means. Well, so, so there are two ways to answer that question. So if the question is basically, does a bad understanding of history lead to bad rules in Congress, I would say potentially, but here's another way to look at it. A good understanding of what happened in history might instruct you in the most useful way to get what you want. And if that means preventing people from having a certain kind of filibuster, because that gives you more control. You know, so I think, um, particularly in the case of congressional rules too, there's a, there's a, a long, long specific detailed rule bound history about what goes on in those chambers. And if you're in Congress, regardless of your understanding of American history, I think you pretty clearly get to understand the pros and cons of some of those rules and what you can and can't do. I also think there are a lot of people who don't know what you can and can't do and don't really care. And I'm not going to name names, but but things like, you know, things that appear like one person holding up a whole slew of nominations, for example. Um, that is a something that the system allows and a person who knows it allows it and is taking advantage of it. And we might not like it, but someone's gonna have to stand up and address the system, the rule to prevent that from happening. This gets back to norms too. We've talked about this before too, that we don't realize something really is a norm until it's violated. And there've been, during the Trump presidency, there were a lot of norms being violated. And my constant historian experience was, Wait, I guess that really isn't mandated in any way. I guess we did sort of just assume everyone would do that. Look, you don't have to do that and there's nothing we can do. Um, that's part of what's going on in our time too, is we discover that again and again and again and again. It makes me think of a teacher. I was online with a group of teachers that were sharing resources last night and a teacher from Kentucky said that one of the um, state standards had poor grammar and so they said, you can't teach this, 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 or that. Instead of saying, and, they put or. And so the teacher said, oh, so it's a choice. So I can either teach this or that. So they basically chose to teach the parts of the standard they thought were truthful. And then I, I'm not teaching this because you said this or that. And so we were laughing, but they said, you know, grammar can sometimes work against you when you're trying to bully people and not let them teach the truth. So all yep. these teachers are just choosing to take the or as the most important word in that statement. Right. Well, and particularly given that some of these statements about what you can't do are focused on the absolutely right, the subject. And you're up and you're it's and it's a great example of reading closely and realizing that, right? There, some of that happened um, before the Constitutional Convention when you know the Constitutional Convention was not given authority to write a whole new government, a whole new, to create a whole new constitution, but they, they pulled at the instructions from different states and found a way to say, oh yeah, we can. <laughs> Look, someone asked or didn't ask for it, but it was a, a similar case of a sort of and either or if statement that, opened that door. So yeah, that can be really important. Of course, it can be important for better and worse, but still, that's why we have lawyers. But that is that is really important. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sydney, our good friend Sydney asks, can history education be used to help promote social change as a lot of social issues are deeply rooted in history? Yeah. 
here's, you know, good history um, is history that gets you to question the way things are uh, and to think about how they might be. Um, and, and I'm not filling in uh, the specifics. I'm not saying to realize the about the present and to stop the in the future. We can fill in lots of words in that. But I think um, it's, yeah, it's important to um, understand, well, again, to, to sort of see where you are and see the problems of when and where you are. Um, and for sure, you can create social change. I mean, you know, I think all the time about um, the fact that over the course of American history, it's often ground level organizing that gets a movement rolling, not top down really, but bottom up or middle out, but, but not necessarily top down. And that's, you know, history, the lessons of history teach, that can be a really effective way of getting people engaged and really creating a movement. Um, regardless of what the movement is promoting, organizationally, that could be a really useful thing. So if you know that, if you understand that in American history and you wanna, you know, argue a, a cause and create a movement, yeah, you're gonna look and see how that worked in the past and see what worked or didn't work and what the result was and think about it and think about what that suggests about American politics and the habits and ethos of American politics and adapt that into what you're doing. Yeah. We're getting a lot of hilarious- um, Oh, I see you, Annie. No, English English just good jokes and- um... <laughs> I'm sorry, but Dale's is the funniest where he, he talks about commas and it says, eat comma grandma or just eat grandma. <laughs> commas. A little daughter party humor here. Oh, and I know that book, Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. Yeah, commas I see that one, important. but the eat grandma one, I was like, kind of cheeky this early in the morning, Dale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, we laugh. commas, sometimes my students, um, it, it's almost like they met privately and came up with their favorite uh, grammatical mistake to make and they each pick one. There was one year where I was like, okay, so one person was comma guy. So let's talk about commas. Like you're hyphen person. Let's talk about, so anyway, yes, commas. I support commas. <laughs> History matters and so do commas. That's a mug, apparently. Write that one down. Okay, um, Dave is asking, will the Khan Academy integration of AI, chat GPT, when it comes to teaching history, counterbalance the Hillsdale colleges and the Prager use? Oh man. Like, can we use AI? I, I gotta say, have you tried putting any of your lesson materials in there yet, Joanne? No. Okay, I was a little bit, there, there's an AI generated app which is free now, but I'm sure it's going to go behind a paywall because that's what they do. They, they get teachers hooked on it and then all of a sudden they charge for it. But it's called Diffit, D-I-F-F-I-T. I put one of Ed's um, blog posts about his summer you know, that travel log series he's been doing. So the one that he wrote about Walden Pond, I put it in there and within three seconds, it, it will rewrite it on different grade levels for reading, like fifth grade, eighth grade. You pick the reading level then it automatically ge generates multiple choice questions, open-ended questions, essay topics. I was, I sent it to him. I was like, oh my gosh. But are <laughs> they, but were they go behind a paywall? Were they like usable? They were good, pretty good. I was that's, shocked. That's scary. I mean, I, I will not claim to understand um, anything. Like I'm, beh I'm always behind technologically somehow. I'm always like, wait. Maybe I need a cell phone. Like I was the last person to get a cell phone. But um, AI just seems like um, there are so many possibilities that we don't know. And then in a sense, people are more excited about what they can do, whether regard uh, other than, or they should be more thinking about thinking about should they do it. So <laughs> I was I was interested because you know a lot of the content we like we have our bunk website which takes like your article that you wrote about the election remember I did a whole lesson around that but a lot of those articles are higher level right a middle school kid might not be able to read a Time or Newsweek or Atlantic or New Yorker article but this will rewrite it in a fifth seventh grade reading level so they can still get the gist of it, and then see all those connections. So then I put one of the bunk articles in it, did the same thing. It generated all that stuff. 
And I made three versions. I made a fifth grade, an eighth grade, and a 10th grade. And none of the real content was lost. Just some of the bigger words, like, you know, Ed's favorite word is capacious. He uses it all the time. Kids yeah. don't know that word in fifth grade, but they can still get the gist of the article and the history. It was really fascinating. I'll, I'm going to do your article later today and send it to you just so you can see it. I would be very curious. It was it was amazing. So just. I just don't on. know. You know, we got some sort of vague statement about AI, maybe the one specific one at Yale. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't know. And, and, and I think we've been told to put a statement in our syllabi about and I, I feel so clueless about it at this point. Um, and I don't know, you know, I could recognize people lifting things out of Wikipedia. AI is a whole different level. And I don't quite know. I'm going to have to go read the statements um, mm -hmm. and, and try and figure out now uh, how to at least have a sense of or how to check for this in a, in a paper other than knowing a student and knowing how they speak in class and then looking at a paper and trying to match is this paper on the level of this person in class? And that doesn't always work. Yeah. It's just, it, it, it's interesting. And, you know, like any other technology, it can be used for good or evil. We're trying to find ways to use it for good. Uh, okay. Uh, Dave uh, had a, another question. So I'm going to pop that one in. He says, good history versus bad history, compare and contrast it with misinformation versus disinformation. What role does the intent of the actor play in differentiating between good, bad, miss, or dis? <laughs> miss her. Now, as someone said, has 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 she said the D word yet? I saw that floating by. Has she said it yet? Um, and so if that's if this is a strategic question. Uh, oh, I, I don't think so. I think he honestly is just asking. No, me. I believe that. I'm yeah. just saying, given yeah. that I know yeah, they're trying to get us to say the word to play bingo. Right, right, right. <laughs> so I'm aware. I'm aware. Um disinformation and misinformation. Now, let me, one of them, let's see if we're going to get this straight. Um, one of them is deliberate and the other one isn't. One of them is like wrong and the other one is deliberately wrong to mislead. And someone here is going to have to help me because I now, uh, uh, Tom got bingo. See, I knew it was going to happen. Um, disinformation or misinformation. We talked about this on a previous episode. Um, misinformed, disinformed. Um, I'm trying to see, does anyone, can anyone come up with a dis, the, um, disinformation is wrong and misinformation is deliberate? Deliberate, okay. Okay, good. Um, anyway, yeah, but that makes obviously a huge difference. Disinformation is deliberate. Okay, D, D, excellent. Ah, good way. Yeah. Gotta love those mnemonic devices. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, our good friend Gloria asks, it says the city university constantly says there's a great deal of racism. They make money by emphasizing racism. Isn't it just as bad to constantly say everyone's a racist? Well, I don't know. I, I, can't say I've come across classes that in which people are saying everyone and everything is all racist and the end. Um, that's she, she not- She wanted to know, could we, how about supporting more positive stuff was her follow-up? Well, I don't, I don't think, you know, I, there's a, I think it's still there. There's a statement still lurking on Twitter. Um, there's a statement in my, at the pin to the beginning of my, Twitter page that talks about this that, um, and I've talked about it before and actually Gloria, I talked about it once and Gloria, I remember you were like, good. Um, I just talked about the fact that you have to acknowledge the bad and the ugly. Um, you have to acknowledge that it's there. You have to acknowledge the legacy of it. You have to acknowledge what we see of it now. And it's also important to acknowledge the um, ideas that unleashed possibilities, even if they weren't created for that purpose. And I, I think I talked last time about, right, some of the ideas about um, rights and democracy and politics that maybe were wrote, woven throughout things from the founding era and were certainly not intended for anyone other than a certain level of white man. But when you get into the 19th century, all kinds of people who were not necessarily white men used those, found those, owned those as a way to 
achieve and accomplish and, and fight their way into getting what they deserve. So the ideas matter. The people who created the ideas did not see them applying to everybody. And that is important to acknowledge. It's not like the founders created inclusive democracy. Yeah, they did not. But the ideas that they encapsulated and some of what they did, even if no one in the time when they were created ever imagined them remotely having anything to do with the way they came to be, those ideas matter. So I, you know, I, there are people certainly who say American history is all wonderful and no one should talk about these bad things. Why are people always talking about bad things? And then there are people who say um, American history is all bad things. And how can you talk about positive things if it's all bad things? Um, I think as a historian, I would say nothing is that simple. It just isn't. Um, it's not all bad, it's not all good, um, but you have to think about how you understand that, how you mean it, how you intend it, how you're going to present it, and how you're going to present it in a way that will encourage the people you're talking to to ask questions and think about possibilities and to walk away not with a sort of clear like, oh, this is bad, but with a, oh, like this, this was bad in this way, but in, it, it allowed this to happen. So let me think through what that means and what does that teach me, for example, about democracy? Yeah. A lot to think about. I know, okay, I'm trying to catch up with the questions on the side here too. I know. So we have a good question from Greg. Did you have some in the chat you wanted to pull out? No, go ahead. Okay, so Greg is asking, hi, Greg. Um, does Joanne know of a book about the history of whitewashing US history in the US? Oh, um, I'm not going to be able to come up with the title, but there is a book which I remember from grad school. So we're talking in ancient history. Um, it was about textbooks and what was and wasn't allowed to be in textbooks, um, which was along these lines. I'm sure there's much, 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 much more than that. And I'm not gonna be able to give you a specific name, but I do remember, and I do know, there have been studies of what people wanted and definitely did not want to be in textbooks. And this one might even have had to do with what textbooks in the South at a certain period of time looked like versus other parts of the country. I think one of my colleagues in grad school wrote a paper about it. Um, I think I even remember his name and I'm not going to give it right now. So why that's stuck in my head, I don't know. But at any rate, there, there are for sure um, discussions of this. Um, if you have access to um, databases, if you're lucky enough to have access to databases, I don't know if um, anyone here uses JSTOR, um, which is just a massive database of articles and some book chapters, that would be an ideal place to go to get academic discussion of that idea. Yeah, we have a lot of JSTOR content and bunk, but some people, is some of it behind a paywall and some of it's free or is all of it free? Well, it, for a little while, it was all free during the pandemic. Yeah. And now I don't know. Yeah. I think a lot of it's behind a paywall, which unfortunately. Well, that's why I asked if you're lucky enough to have it because yeah. forever it, it was behind a paywall and it, your library had to own it. Um, but some of it might still, like some of it seems to be out there because sometimes I'll Google something and I'll come up with an article and it's clearly from JSTOR. So I don't know the answer to that. But yeah. but the, the the shorter version of that is, um, it's a really good question um, and it would be worth investigating online too because there are going to be people talking about in, in a long hallway or in a very specific moment in time regarding race or regarding region or whatever. Um, there's a lot of discussion of it. I just personally haven't read that literature because I sort of stay in the 18th and early 19th century. Yeah. So Joanne, if you look in the chat, I just put your essay into Diffit. If you click on that link. Oh. And um, you do I have to create a free account. You have to like, when you click on it to be able to see the whole thing, they make you, you can just log in with your Google email, okay. but they make you create an account to see it, but it's free. Um, okay. It's just fascinating. I think I think you'll really enjoy seeing how they rewrote your paragraph, your your article for seventh graders. But then it's it's not too shabby. The the act, they give you the vocabulary, they pull the vocabulary right out for you and define it. I mean, 
I spent I hours coming up with kid appropriate vocabulary definitions. If this will do it for me for that alone, I'll just use it to get the vocabulary definitions lickety split. And um, yes, I am a nerd. <laughs> no, no I, that's not what I was going to say at all. No, Caroline did. <laughs> oh, okay. Someone she, just, the, she, she is too, though. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you can't use the nerd. I don't think nerd is a bad thing anymore. Well, I, and you can't use it around history minded people because that's I, just like, I like details. That's like saying you breathe oxygen. <laughs> <option, then. laughs> yes. Um, nerd is a good thing, but someone just posted um, an article. Um, there's a very long link that I don't know what it's to there. Um, so, so, oh, there. Uh, Clinton. Yeah. Right. Clinton. Uh, so right. Links in. Okay. So wonderful. People are putting wonderful links in. Um, so that's good. Because, yeah. It's, I need to go to New York just to get some time with Clinton to because he always makes me feel better about history. <laughs> oh, he's such a good person. Jenny and I had fun hanging out with him last um, last winter in Philly. Okay, uh, do we have any more time, John? Ooh. Two, three um, Ellen asks, well, she said it's more of an after party question, so we'll save that one. They, a lot of people are, are talking about the AI piece with the Khan Academy, but we've already had a couple of questions on that. Is Ameri Here's one from Linda. Is American exceptionalism part of bad history? We've been hearing a lot about that phrase. Um, in some ways, yes, because what American history can teach is that bad things that happen in other places will not happen here because we're exceptional. And, um, you know, I think 9-11 was a bopped people over the head with that in part, right? Because people were like, all these bad things happen in other parts of the world, but we're here and we're safe. Um, which, you know, in early America, they were like, oh, we're separated by an ocean. This is excellent, right? And we, they can't come and get us here. Um, but 9-11 made it very apparent that bad things happening elsewhere for sure are going to happen on our soil, not just Pearl Harbor, but for sure are going to happen um, on our soil. So that's one way in which um, exceptionalism, uh, you know, is bad. But I think more than that, the idea that we're exceptional, so we shouldn't fear some things. I've been I've been talking about, howling about, arguing about American exceptionalism and the way it's doing harm to us right now for years at this point. And my argument is always, if you believe that what we're seeing now isn't dangerous and that everything will be okay because it has always been okay, because America is exceptional, you are not, your eyes are not open. Right, we are in danger in so many ways, and assuming that because we're ex exceptional, we don't have to look at it, we don't have to worry about it, nothing's going to happen. That's a dangerous way of thinking, and you might not, we might not all agree on the degree to which we are in danger, and that's fine. But just to say oh, we don't have to think about all this stuff because America always does great, we're exceptional in that way. That's not useful. That's that's a different form of blinders. Um, so in that way, you know, it, again, you can't. I will say in a general way, it is very easy to see how that kind of exceptionalism can lead to either bad history or no history, and instead lead us to the sort of cheerleading, whitewashing way of understanding the past. A lot of people were talking about the in the chat the climate change policies and kids are starting to file lawsuits all across the country, basically trying to sue the government for not protecting them by pushing back on things like climate change legislation. Um, and yesterday, the response the House is trying to put more fossil fuels out there, like undo some of the things that have already been done, and then make it easier for people to continue to drive big gas guzzling cars and. Well, I, you know, the courts, it's the most obvious thing to say that I'll say it, we're running almost out of time. Um, one of the ways in which we can really fight back against some of what's happening now is the courts. Now, of course, the courts are vulnerable, depending on who the judge is, but the fact that, generally speaking, the rule of law still exists here and people all deserve a fair trial, um, that matters profoundly. I mean, I almost, I shouldn't even have to say that, but um, that's kind of like, you know, if you make a telephone call to a member of Congress, ultimately, if a lot of people do that, it matters. I think that, you know, the same thing holds true here is that it 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 matters. Um, I'm looking to catch up here. Um, yeah, all kinds of people, exceptionalism, 
blinds us to the good things that happen in other countries. That's very true. W one of the Jennifers. That's very true, right? We're part of the world. Um, it's one thing to study your nation, but in isolation, that doesn't exist anymore. Not that it ever did, but we live in a world now where, you know, to me, one of the ultimate things that the pandemic proved or should have proven is that we're all in one world and that national boundaries do not protect us uh, against things in the way that we might assume they do, that we have to think about the world and our place in the world. Um, the one last thing I was going to say, and then we're going to shift into that after party, um, so talking about climate and um, lawsuits about climate, I did stumble across um, one of the Prager U videos that um, explicitly is uh, about climate change denial and how that's good and how if you think the climate is changing, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going with the trend, but if you're a denier, you're brave and courageous and standing up right. Um, like I said, research Prager you to understand what it is rather than have me tell you um, and evaluate it for whatever you see it as. Okay. So um, I put uh, Untold History is a series of videos. Um, they're free and they're wonderful. And I, they're to me, you know, they're the counter to Prager you and they've been around a lot longer. They've been around for years. So if you want good videos, really, and they're all animated, so kids love them. Um, they're really well done. It's If you just type in untold history video, Makematic, I think, is the company that puts them out. But iCivics has embedded them in their re learning resources. We have them in ours. Other museums have used them. They're great. So you don't okay. have to watch PragerU. There's plenty of free good videos. Well, that's there. the truth, right? There's lots really of good it. for kids and really honest and free but not me, an official vendor of Florida. And the untold people have promised us that they will never put theirs behind a paywall because they have the same feeling we do about that. So um, that's the only reason we put them in our stuff. I said, these can never go behind a paywall. And I made them put it in writing just like I did with Dr. Ayer. So <laughs> you know how I am. <laughs> okay. So um, we so are in the past. Um, I want to, as ever, um, Thank you all for coming here on yet another Friday morning uh, to engage in the conversation of democracy, uh, which matters profoundly no matter how many of us are actually here at any given time, it matters. It matters because of the kind of conversations that we have here. It matters because you can take these conversations and what you think because of them elsewhere. If we can't engage in these kinds of conversations, we're in deep trouble. So thank you for being here for that and for proving week after week after week, we don't have to all agree absolutely to have this kind of good conversation. This is how things should work. Um, and also just thank you for being the amazing community that you are, um, that, you know, in the same way that my students kind of give me hope, um, the fact that we've been here like 174 episodes. I mean, really, uh, when I think back to when I started this, that was not what I thought would happen. Um, but the fact that we have been here and, and continue to be here, that matters too. That's a commitment to education, to history, and to democracy. So um, thank you for that. Uh, I hope everyone has a good week. Take care of yourselves. Be as cool as you can be. Annie and John, um, thank you as ever um, for making this possible and taking part in it. And um, Obviously, if you weren't here, it couldn't exist. So I appreciate you in so many ways. I can't even tell you. Um, and John, you're my partner in crime too. I don't call you that, but you are. At any rate, okay. So what we're going to do now is- Someone just got bingo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what we're going to do now is segue to the after party. What that means is that we are no longer going to be recording this conversation. Um, so we could be a little freer and easier in our conversation. Not that we've been stiff before, but it won't be recorded. So we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. If you're on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook to join us in the after party. Uh, you need to go to nche.teach.org slash conversations. That's nche.teach.org slash conversations. Click on that and poof, you will be in the after party. Um, so, okay, I, I hope to see a bunch of you in the after party. Um, say as cool as you can, uh, and I'll see you guys next week. Yep. I'm wondering, is Jonathan still awake? Is he still with us? <laughs> That's, I, 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 
I salute Jonathan, man. <laughs>